works. Um, from a Splunk perspective, we're really trying to help customers see the value in what they're collecting. It's not just about collecting log data, but it's actually collecting, you know, real insight and telemetry and seeing what your application is doing, how people are interacting with it. Um, I'll just kind of run through this real quick. You know, I've been doing this for 15 years. Um, one of the jokes at Splunk is uh, they call me the unicorn because I'm able to do development operations and security. So it's one of those things where, you know, like I don't sleep very much, so you can see I'm kind of wired sometimes. But uh, <laughs> so, so one of the things that I really like to do, and this has become a very personable thing for me because I came from a very toxic team, is trying to take all the stuff I learned from a negative experience and actually help uh, teams develop a better experience for their DevOps engineering. And really what it comes down to is, you know, I've take, I've work, I started working at Splunk to basically take this simple process of collecting data and making it more useful and actually analyzing how behaviors are happening within a group. Um, how many of you guys are actually Splunk customers today? Just kind of, okay, perfect. So, so uh, as you know, you know, we're, we're trying to be the next, uh, what we call data fabric for, uh, for DevOps as well as for anything else in the industry. Um, when I think about Splunk as a whole, you know, we're a platform that allows developers, operational engineers, and security professionals to get uh, quick insight. When I think about you know, how we work with our partners, you know, XMatters is a good example of how we're strategically aligning ourselves to provide a single gateway so that everyone can bring their data in and actually collaborate in near real time. And as you guys know, if you're not, if you're not a Splunk customer, um, we're very extensible when we talk about all the ways we integrate uh, data points within our platform. So it's not just about log aggregation. You know, about 10 years ago, we were really focused around being the Google for data centers. But now we're really focused on actually collecting data in near real time, providing a way to do it from a non-traditional perspective, and then also helping you in your next generation software delivery cycle. So, well, so one of the things um, I get to do is, it's kind of interesting because you know, from a from a DevOps perspective, I'm actually helping teams understand their process, their workflow. It's very similar to how event management works. You know, how do those specific things that are happening in your environment today? helping you lead the direction of where your software is going to take you. So one of the things that I've done is uh, it's really focused around kind of breaking up the silos in a way that provides communication between different teams. Uh, one of the things that I also have a challenge with is, you know, these different teams typically don't work very well together. So uh, the joke is, you know, project managers typically, unless they've been in the industry for a long period of time, actually make a lot of demands on developers that, you know, like for example, you know, if you're have a, uh, a limit of five to six story points per sprint, and all of a sudden the PMO is like, well, you can handle 10. They're not using a data different approach to say that, you know, based on all these factors, you may fail at the end of the sprint because we've given you too much work. And so what I've been able to do is actually kind of figured out a way of, from a behavioral perspective, understanding how all these different groups work from actually taking the data points and actually building a pipeline. So um, as the title saying, planning for scale performance, how do we actually take these groups and their tool sets, very similar to Jira, uh, Bitbucket, and Bamboo, and actually orchestrate it in a way that provides vi full visibility across the whole stack? And really what it looks like is actually helping these groups understand how that process works. So from a very simplistic perspective, we have different ways of looking at how tickets are open, how they're closed, how many times they're reopened. But how do you actually take that data element and actually understand that behavior? Because um, a lot of groups that we've talked to and also work with, you know, they go from an open status to a resolve status pretty quickly. But then every couple weeks, it goes back into reopen status because something wasn't created correctly or something was actually being funneled. Um, someone accidentally closed the ticket out when they shouldn't have. Um, and then also generates what we call alert fatigue because you then you have a, a million uh, chat notifications or incident change responses and all those windows keep opening and opening and opening. So uh, this is why one of the things when I'm working with these teams is helping, actually helping them understand where their, their problems are. So um, the one, uh, one story that I always kind of like to tell uh, customers is really kind of understanding, you know, specifically, you know, what are the challenges when we talk about planning and process? So um, I work with a lot of the Department of Defense contractors. I work a lot with FinTech. And the commonality between all the different teams is actually understanding how the planning process works. And I typically, when I walk in these engagements, you know, a good story is like, I always like the whiteboard exactly what their process looks like today. 90% of the time, you know, teams are kind of like fumbling and they're trying to figure out, okay, how do we really do planning process? How do these elements actually build our product? 
And one of the things that I also look at is, you know, when they ask me certain questions like, well, what do you mean by opening a ticket? How do we actually handle it? That actually helps me determine the maturity factor in the specific groups. And um, when I talk about, you know, specifically from a global perspective, you know, I, I deal with a lot of me accounts and Americans and APAC, and everyone has a different way of doing this and different ways of approaching different uh, elements and, and specific events. And specifically, when I kind of sit them down and say, hey, you know, let's, let's kind of like forget your process right now. Let's, talk about how we would do it, you know, from a best practices perspective. And, you know, it, it's like nine times out of ten, they're like, wow, it's really simplistic on how we, we can do that. And so w when I go through these processes, you know, we, we go from one iteration to another. So this one specifically around planning. When we talk about build automation and how teams interact with release engineers and testing teams or even QA teams, there's another way to take a look at it so that we can cross-link back to the other teams. And as I discussed before, we've come up with this process of uh, what we consider a life cycle ID or a life cycle process. And those processes actually help you understand from the time that someone releases code till the time it hits an environment, how does that data actually present it in a way that helps someone understand how that release went. It's, uh, there's a couple different ways to also look at it as well is when we look at, you know, when a system tells us a release is done, it actually specifically says if the service is up or if it's behaving in a certain way. But there's also a user recorded availability perspective as well. So when we look at different elements of like login behavior, how long it specifically takes, those elements actually contribute to the factor that, you know, based on these code changes, this many developers, how many hours they put in this project contributed to the customer not being able to log in fast enough. And so this whole iteration, this whole process is, you know, you're failing quite often, but you're also learning from your mistakes and being able to trend it over a period of time. Which also leads into the whole process of, you know, team workflow and delivery. So one of the things that I've actually focused on with our customers is really help them understand how do we bring this a little bit closer. You don't want to boil the ocean when you do these uh, use cases, but you want to get a better understanding of how we, can we get these teams to communicate better in a way that's non-intrusive, but then also help them understand that, you know, by you throwing something over the wall doesn't mean that you've actually dropped the ball and actually focused on the fact that this stuff is actually just, you know, failing because of certain thing um, based on the data points. Um, and also, uh, when we look at you know, some of the methodologies around agile uh, process and planning, you know, the streamlining each one of these different environments and helping people understand how this process is working around timing, around um, ideal to uh, production, around you know, cycle times, all these things can contribute to actually delivering a better product. And in this example, you know, this is the same concept I go through with a lot of my uh, financial customers, is helping them understand, you know, let's focus on one area and actually uh, improve this process and then also be, build reporting around it so you can actually see where you're failing as well. Uh, one of the things that I've actually done uh, in taking this job at Splunk is I've uh, worked on this whole concept of gamifying the DevOps experience. And so when I look at all the different ways that, you know, customers interact with our product, you know, one of the things that, you know, uh, software engineers are always looking for is how do we make this process a little bit more active? How do you make it more fun? And so uh, uh, typically what I do in, the, in a lot of these events, I get people to pull their mobile phone out and I have them go to a URL and I show them based on you know, specific factors of this game as they're playing it, in real time I can show them the details around analytics around it, how the software is behaving, how many errors are associated with it. And we put in a lot of different like Easter eggs within the application so when you hit those specific points, you can see that real time telemetry gets fed into Splunk in a way that helps you understand your process. Um, and then also, when it comes down to it, there's a lot of different ways to look at, you know, how automation, how does uh, testing work within the platform? How do you instrument in a way that as you're working on this application or as you're presenting it to your customer, that is actually fun and also is, is uh, problem free? Um, the interesting about how we develop this game is, is around kind of getting people to understand what next generation software development is all about. You know, it's not just about, you know, building a Docker container or trying to build some type of metrics or, uh, you know, basically finding an auto automated fashion to just push it out into production, but it's also getting telemetry to understand where did that software begin before it actually hit the uh, production environments or even pre-prod environments. And then also, you know, when we get to the point of understanding the specific elements around how things are happening in the environment, this is a really good example of taking open source technology and instrumenting it in a way that provides feedback 
within the platform so that you can stay in one uh, single tool set. Um, for, for many of you, how many of you guys have actually gotten to the point where you've been instrumented your full stack, your full testing automation, and then when you go to release it into production, you can give a full report to say that this is going to be a stable release? No one right, really, right? So that's kind of the thing that, you know, from a, from a Splunk perspective, we're trying to get customers to get to that point. I mean, internally, we practice this our, on, our, on ourselves because of the fact that you have to eat your own dog food to actually present it to the customers. And so we've also taken a data-driven approach of taking all the information, all the tool set that we've actually, uh, we're using within our own platform so that we can actually safely tell customers that we've taken the process, we've actually understood the data based on what we're doing internally from an HRS perspective, from a developer behavior perspective, from an operations perspective, this, these components will work as we're delivering it. Um, and really what it looks like when you talk about a whole uh, continuous integration deployment cycle is we have a product called ITSI. And what that allows you to do is actually take all those data points and make it more friendly in a way that you can actually go deeper into some of these analytic points. And uh, this is actually a really good example of us actually looking at our development platform, instrumenting it in a way that Splunk can capture the data, and actually uh, giving us better insight to see how our process works from beginning to end. And this is uh, one of the funner projects because, you know, this wasn't just about selling a product. This wasn't just about you know, presenting kind of a marketing fluff, but showing people that we can actually do it ourselves in a way that was easy and concise uh, when we actually started bringing this data into our platform. And I actually really enjoyed this project because of the fact that, you know, we, we took something as simple as a game that we were just going to use it for our conference and then building a full ecosystem and actual workshop to show customers how they can actually do it in their environment as well. And you know, really what it comes down to is when we look at all these different metrics, all these different deployments that we've done, the total health score of this environment, you know, it, it allows us to integrate other things as well. So, you know, taking a look at some of the planning process, you know, we used HipChat to basically integrate all these tool stacks together. So if something failed for our customers as we're testing it, um, you know, we use Trello for specific, you know, small development uh, resources getting the notifications in faster so people could actually see what's happening when we work in very dispersed teams. This specific project was actually a, a cross collaboration between three to four different engineering groups. And so what was really important about that is, you know, we have teams in Canada, we have teams in India, we have teams in Shanghai, and also in the US. And we're able to get this constant feedback as people are committing code and then actually making changes and, and recommending uh, modifications and also working on feature sets that we're able to get this, get this constant stream of information, not only from the Splunk ecosystem, but other tool sets as well. And when I look at it as well, it, you know, it comes down to, you know, how do we monitor all these things, you know? As you were talk, talking about, you know, when it comes down to microservices, you know, it, it, you're getting that application view, but what actually powers that application? So there's a multitude of different ways that we can actually capture those details via apps, via technology add-ons, via, you know, actual third-party applications, and bringing it all together. And one of the use cases I really, really wanted to talk about today was around, you know, how we actually built this simple process of actually telling someone, you know, based on your current design process, this is how, you're, how your environment's connected. Um, this one's actually a really fun use case because this company actually uses a COTS platform. They have a springboard development uh, process. And what they're able to do is actually take a very disjointed development process and actually do true agile using the Splunk platform to do it. And the reason I kind of bring it up that way is because when we started this engagement, they had the full Elastian stack, but nothing that was ever connected to each other. So they didn't know, you know when something was committed to when it hit Bamboo to when it actually hit production. They had no correlation or no telemetry behind that. But we wanted to keep it as a simple process. So we started this process of, well, let's not boil the ocean, but let's focus on these specific key elements in your business. So we looked at how they were building this application, specifically around their customizations and compiling it. Then we focused on how they were actually testing the framework so that when we look at all the specific elements in that application, how does that relate to the changes that we made? And then ultimately correlating it to how we're actually pushing in the production environment. So how do we actually track uh, uh, bugs? How do we actually look at the application lifecycle management? And then also through the automation process. Um, and what's really interesting about this process is from the build to run perspective, this all stayed within Splunk in a way that allowed this company to understand from beginning to end what actually happened. Then we started getting into the technology ecosystem of where we have partnerships with. 
And so uh, I actually had uh, one of these use cases where we actually were able to work with a company called Workato and actually integrate our build process into Confluence basically by dropping Splunk uh, information or Splunk events into kind of like a blob, creating a page, and then the technical writers can actually clean up the white space and actually uh, spend time on change management calls that are associated with the changes that were made through the git commits as well as what they were getting in the build artifacts. And then, as you guys saw earlier, having that glass table looking at, at that full build process. So their glass table actually resembles this full process from beginning to end. We're taking the change management process, you know, looking at the uh, severity of uh, issues within the environment, correlating it to the releases, and then also using uh, third-party open source uh, APM management to take a look at specific things around transaction traces and linking those to specific release cycles. The next one is around a major insurance company. Uh, I presented this actually at our conference last year, uh, AAA Insurance. It has a very legacy style waterfall release, but they also call it a waterfall agile release. And what was interesting about it is they have very dissimilar teams. So they have one uh, group that actually is full waterfall. Uh, they do maybe two releases a year if they're lucky. They have an agile bug fix team that actually focuses on fixing specific bugs in near real time. And then the third team is around actually supporting the application as a whole. So if a customer has an issue, um, they notice something that's going wrong, they're actually testing it and actually creating tickets within uh, RTC to basically tell the development staff, hey, we need to really focus on this. This needs to be part of the next hotfix release. And one thing you'll notice is, you know, no matter what tool set you have, there's a way for you to actually take a look at the information correlated in a way that is normalized and taking that normalized data and actually building a pipeline. And so this is the same concept as the other one where we actually focused on each individual area and then taking it through the process of actually tagging the releases so that from the time something actually gets created till the time it needs to be fixed, we know that specific release has associated changes, pushing it through ITSI to get that full visibility per perspective, doing the change management through ServiceNow, and then also using Dynatrace to do business process management as well as doing APM management. And uh, with that said, you know, there's a lot of things that, you know, from a Splunk perspective that we try to help our customers with. So there's a multitude of different resources and ways that we see things. Um, you'll notice that our staff is pretty passionate about sharing their personal lives and how they're Splunking things. We have a guy that's actually uh, in our group that Splunks his garden, surprisingly. And he's really focused around, you know, understanding how to build better organic crops. And then we also have people that are very uh, passionate about Kafka and other things. So. I just want to kind of bring it up that, you know, we have a ton of resources if you're kind of interested in how we're doing all this process, and then also how to accelerate some of your development as well. Um, in addition, we actually work with a lot of third-party vendors, so we have our alliance with Docker. Uh, we've actually uh, put uh, quite a bit of time and effort into the engineering around collecting logs from a containerized perspective, so not even, you know, syslog, but actually interfacing with the Docker engine. And then also, we have a bunch of SDKs that actually integrate with a lot of different technology stacks. So um, it's really powerful specifically around when customers see some of the stuff we're doing with you know, the gamifying experience and then taking a look at how we're doing it and then corresponding it back to our documentation and actually recreate it as well. And with that being said, I thank you guys for giving me the time. And if you guys have any questions, let me know.